myself. I am Jim Stegeman. I am president and CEO of CostQuest. Uh, we are one of the sponsors of this meeting, and we're happy to sponsor it each year. Uh, we think it's a good gathering of experts in the field of valuation, technology, kind of brings it all together so that we can really understand this. Um, we, CostQuest is uh, known primarily or initially for our tax work. Um, so we do a lot of replacement cost new studies for most, many of the participants in this room. Um, those studies have been used over the last 15 years. Uh, we do work for the FCC, uh, other regulatory bodies, state agencies, and I'll walk you through one of our exciting new products that um, actually is involved in the broadband bead program. So I'll, I'll start there. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to channel my inner Jeff. So I've worked with Jeff and Jeff's not here. How can I channel my inner Jeff? Um, we've been working together for years, so I thought I'd do a quiz. Um, as I was researching material for the slideshow, I just found some interesting facts. And some of this just plays into just technology evolution. I didn't know these things, and it's just how long has this stuff been around? So does anybody know who deployed the first US video phone? JFK, 1962. Oh, really? Was it? I, I don't know. No. Now, Bill Ladd, 1964. Uh, it was AT&T, 1970. Pittsburgh made the first video, co video call on their new service, their new video phone service that they thought would take, would ramp out aggressively. Um, it, it fell apart, one, because in today's dollars, it costs $900 a month for the service. You were limited to 30 minutes a month, I think it was, and the other party had to have a video phone. So it was pretty restrictive. Um, so that, in part, led to its demise. The other thing that led to its demise is AT&T wasn't able to cross-subsidize the service to make it cost-effective to actually get that demand out. So they had a huge hurdle coming out. Second question, in what year and whose photophone invention was the precursor of the fiber optic communication we talk about today? Alexander Graham Bell, 1870. He called the photophone his um, favorite invention that he ever had. So he actually used a beam of light to transmit his voice, I think it was across the street. Um, so it was just, I, I never, never knew of that. And, you know, that. That's how long, you know, this thought of using optical traffic to transmit voice has been around. When did AT&T roll out mobile service? <laughs> 1946. 1946. There's a, if you get the presentation, you can click on the link. There's, there's a great thing you can do is go type in and look for the AT&T Video Archives. It's a great resource. It goes back in time, and it's all the AT&T Bell System videos from back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. They have a 5E video. They, have, they actually have an artificial intelligence video back from 1986 that I watched the other night, because um, I was just trying to find out stuff about AI. Uh, they didn't call it, well, they, they referenced AI in it, but it's just a great resource. So if you just want to look at some fun stuff, go to that. And then when was the field of AI formally founded? Uh, 1970s, uh, to, um, to beat someone in chess. Uh, Bill Ladd, 1970. The, the imitation game. So 1956 is really when the, the, the um, concept was adopted. Dartmouth College began programs on AI. I think it was back in 1956. In 1952, Alan Turing, Alan Turing, Turing had the imitation game in 1952. Does anybody know what the imitation game was? Which is why it's a kind of a test some people think it's a test for AI. Others do not. Um, the imitation game was he placed a male and a female 
in a separate rooms, no one could see it, and they answered questions and you had to guess who was the female, who was the male. Later on, for, I think four years later, he used it on computers of could you identify when the computer was answering versus when someone else was not. So that, that I think actually is very important today. I mean, chat GPT, Carl and I were in the car driving around looking at uh, cell towers last, or in um, December. And we were talking about chat GBT, we were talking about DALI, just these AI programs that are coming out. And just the explosion around chat GPT is amazing. Um, it was a uh, um, Wharton MBA, MBA program professor. He actually would have passed the chat GBT, given him an MBA, because they asked him the questions for the MBA, and chat GPT got a B uh, from that. Um, there's an article out today, I don't know if it's in New York Times or I forget which one it was, just about the fear that chat GBT is really instilling in people. Google is concerned about their search engine. Um, there's probably functional obsolescence among us now because what chat GPT will be able to do. So it's just, it's an amazing technology, which leads then to my <clears throat> next slide. And let me just tee it up. So if you've attended my presentations in the past, and John's not here, oh, shoot. Um, I have a Carl cartoon, typically, in my presentations. <laughs> and the Carl cartoons are not necessarily about Carl, but you know, Carl is just a generic term for an appraiser that I use. Um, <laughs> and Dilbert always has some nice Carl cartoons, so I include them in my presentation. So I said, I've exhausted my Dilbert stash of Carl cartoons, so I said, why don't I use Dally? And ask it, give me a cartoon of Carl the appraiser. <laughs> That's all I asked, this is what I got back. Carl is in the Lone Star State, and I have seen Carl wear the badge to you know, testify, so it matches. But it was just an interesting interpretation. So DALI is, is the AI art. There are graphic artists who are vastly concerned about this because of its ability to put together artwork. You just specify terms, type, whatever it may be, and it comes back with art. Why are you so angry? <laughs> and his hair, you know? <laughs> And the yellow tie, I, I just was, so I didn't want to stop there. I was just having some fun. So I asked the next question. Give me a realist interpretation of Carl the appraiser winning an argument. So on the left, I don't know if Carl's punching the person. You know, I, I, in part, it's tr just trying to you, in, it, figure out what the, uh, the developers of the program are doing and what it pulled together to come up with that. And then I, I, there was other ones that came back. This one was my favorite. It's what some people look like after Carl's talked for <laughs> such a long time. If you've ever felt that, ah. So anyway, I just wanted to lighten it up a little. Um, final item. I thought ChatGBT could actually put together my slideshow today. So I said, Give me a slideshow covering the latest developments in U.S. broadband market. It came back pretty good. It came back in 30 seconds. And actually, probably five of these bullets are what I'm going to cover today. Took me a month to figure out this stuff. It 30 seconds came back with this. Um, it, it did give me a warning. On the first one I asked, it gave me a warning that its content is limited to 21, 2021 and before. So it didn't know enough about bead to pull bead into this discussion about broadband. So it's exciting stuff. It's scary stuff. Um, but we'll see where it goes. Is it all true? That's what I want to know. 
So let me, let me start first with our exciting new product. I, I, this is not a product presentation. I'm not trying to sell you anything. This just leads to further items in the presentation. So we were asked by the FCC to develop the National Broadband Fabric. That National Broadband Fabric is the latitude and longitude, the address, whether it's a residential or business, um, of every building structure in the U.S. It's a database of 115 million points um, that we've produced through a, an exercise, and I'll just walk you through it quickly. Um, it, it's a fun exercise. Actually, Carl's team is helping us on some of this. The, the question is, as you look at that, tell me what are the broadband serviceable locations in that that we should hold providers to to make sure they provide service to those? And then if we want to fund, which one should we fund? So that's, that's, the, that's the exercise. Um, here, we pull in public parcel data. So parcels are the public ownership of land. Uh, typically, a phone company or a cable company will run onto the property, then it's the property's owner to dis distribute it around the property. So the parcels are a nice uh, demarcation point. And then we bring in what where AI actually comes in is we work with partners. Carl's team helps us on some of this. We do some of it ourselves. Is you can take aerial imagery, satellite imagery. You train the imagery by circling structures. You say, this is what I want to look for. The AI then identifies the pixelization change. And then we'll come up with the polygons that represent the buildings. And you can barely see it here, but there's a polygon here. We have. In our database, I think we have 181 million polygons in the US that we look at and digest and figure out what to do with them. We then bring in all the tax assessor data. So the tax assessor data gives us information about the land use, gives us information uh, of a structure on the property, how big the structure is, all that type of stuff. We use this in machine learning to help train the model that as you see this collection of building footprints on this type of parcel, the answer is yes, there's a broadband service point, or no, there's not. Then we bring in address data sets to finally come up with these blue dots. And as I said, there's 115 million blue dots in the country. And we give that out to the FCC. The FCC then ingests that, which is what I'm gonna go into the next, into the National Broadband Map. This is a great tool. If you've not been to the National Broadband Map, I'd advise you to go look at it. It's a great tool for analysis, a great tool for research, a great tool for just understanding where broadband is today. So the FCC shifted its broadband uh, to the broadband data collection effort. So if you've been in the broadband world, you know the FCC collects what was called 477 data. Um, they required every provider who provides broadband service in the country to report at the census block, do you provide broadband into the census block? There's about seven and a half million census blocks um, in the country in which there is population, homes, structures, whatever it may be. So that's where the reporting was before. The FCC now has moved to this national fabric. I said 115 previously. In the first release, it was 114. We've added a million in the release that we just gave them. Um, fixed providers must now ingest that and then report to the FCC at each address, each location, what technology do they provide, what latency, and what speed. So great resource. The map is updated every six months. Currently we have over 2,000 ISPs and government agencies using the data. The first version was published in November of 2022. Uh, the next iteration is in process right now. Carriers received the data on January 3rd. Their information is back March 1st. Um, this data is challengeable. I'll, I'll walk you through that. And probably the, the thing that I'll walk through when I get into bead is there are parties who have falsely claimed the effort of failure. Uh, to me, it's a great effort. It's an iterative effort. The first version, first version of anything is just fraught with issues just because it's new to everyone. You've got to have time to adapt to that new system. What people aren't doing is given the time. And the reason people aren't given the time 
is there is $42 billion dependent upon this map. This map will identify where that money gets dispersed throughout the country. So you can, you can identify the people that are complaining down here are those parties that want to shift the money. So if you go into the map, there's not a lot of information on this map, but I went to a random location uh, in Versailles, Indiana. Uh, and as you look at it, these dots are the fabric that we provide. Each of the providers in the country report back information. As you key in your address, you'll see over here the providers and the service. You'll see that Hughes Systems LLC provides 25.3 over satellite. There's a fiber provider, which is the electric co-op, I think provides gigabit service. There is, lo and behold, T-Mobile. Who would have thought T-Mobile would be a broadband provider? Um, however, their service is 200 kilobit. Um, a little bit to be desired, but I won't comment on that. <laughs> but as you see this map, you can key in your address. Go there now, go look at the address, see what service is available. It's a great resource for you because you never knew this before. You may have guessed who provides service to you, um, but now you have a pinpoint accuracy of who provides service. You can actually, uh, you can challenge this. If you say that is just total BS, I called this fiber company, they can't get me service. You can challenge that. That challenge then has to be adjudicated by the FCC, so the FCC will take it to that carrier. The carrier has to prove that they actually provide service to that location. The reason for this challenge, again, is because $42 billion rides upon this map. I knew Steve would be here today, so I thought I'd do a TMO map. So there's two, two parts to the map. There is fixed broadband, and then there's mobility. So this is on the fixed side. Actually, I was surprised by this. When this first came out in November, um, I looked at TMO and I said, holy shit, because it's a lot. I mean, if you look at this, I forget, it's like 97 percent of the country, 90 percent of the locations in the country have access to T-Mobile fixed service. So Steve was right on. They provide fixed service everywhere. The issue, though, is what, which of it is actually of sufficient speed that you could call it a substitute for the landline. And, and when I ran that, this is, I think, at 120. You, you can see it in the slide presentation. But this is what is considered, quote, served by the FCC. So still a great proportion. I forget, I don't remember the exact percentage, but it's a pretty big percentage of the country has access to T-Mobile fixed wireless service licensed spectrum. So then I did a, a dive into AT&T Charter Comcast. They were just up here. Um, we talked about fiber. So I said, where have they deployed fiber in the country? So the pink is AT&T. They're at around, I think, 10% of the locations in the country have access, according to the data collection, to AT&T fiber. Here is Comcast at less than, not it, over 0%. I'll just say that. I couldn't find the number. And then Charter is actually more, but still not at 1%. But you can see the disbursement. The Comcast is just the little purple dots. So they've really focused on urban core centers, it looks like. Um, John can attest to Charter is likely to expand out fiber in their RDOF areas so that their fiber footprint will grow. And Gary talked about his fiber footprint growing um, with the additional investment they're, that they're making. If you take out those carriers, but you say, OK, let me look where fiber has been deployed. It's a pretty big um, deployment of fiber in the country. So it's not the big carriers that are deploying the fiber. Um, they are deploying the fiber to the most customer locations, but per area. It's actually the small rural carriers. You might look at this and go, why in the heck is North Dakota fully served with fiber? That's because the rural carriers took the money that they received from the FCC in universal service and invested into their network into fiber. 
So that money does sometimes go back into the network for good. But it's, uh, if you look at this, I think total penetration with fiber uh, is about 35%. The interesting thing is, is some of these fiber providers don't provide gig service. So this is the speed tier, so you can go into this and look at that. Not to slight the mobility carriers, because we heard them earlier today. I just looked at the mobility coverage. <clears throat> Again, I, what I did is I filtered this on 5G NR, so new radio, uh, with a min uh, minimum speed of 35.3 available. Um, actually, the carrier that reported more coverage in this, surprisingly, was AT&T. I don't know why TMO's coverage was less. It, it, um, I don't know how it was reported, but just based upon the map. Um, Verizon, if you looked at the layering of TMO and AT&T, they're almost equivalent. Um, Verizon is the smallest footprint of the three, according to the FCC's map. So why is this one important? So the prior one, the, the fixed broadband is important for bead program, ARP program, which I'll walk through. The mobility, um, the FCC has Mobility Fund 2 coming out, a $9 billion fund, $9 billion. Uh, parties are arguing it to be $25 billion, and it's to expand mobile service to those areas of the country that don't have 5G. Um, so that is coming up, and they'll use this map to drive that program. So now getting into the funding. What, what the, the, the intent of that map was to help policymakers understand where people have service, where they do not. This is the end point of that map. So the FCC map identifies served. So they have three basic uh, classifications. Served is 120 speed. Um, underserved is 25.3. And then unserved is under 25.3. Speed adds further definition to that, that the latency has to be under 100 millisecond. It excludes all satellite. So Starlink is taken out, Hughes is taken out, Viasat is taken out. And it excludes those unlicensed fixed wireless providers. We heard that earlier today. Um, and when you do that, this is the distribution of states. There's about 8 million unserved locations. It's about 10 million living units unserved. 14 million un and underserved locations. This, I'll walk you through in a minute, is how the bead dollars will be distributed. Right here, 90% of the bead dollars, 90% of that 42 billion, give or take will be driven by that. What's the top state? Texas. Michigan, Florida, Georgia. Uh, California actually is down here. I mean, when you think of the most populous states, they're not up there. It's, well, Texas is. But it's just surprising. The other surprising thing is just the relative differential in that. And I'll walk you through what, what kind of money that means. Jim, one more time. Is it the gray line on the bottom? It's the gray line on the bottom. Orange, orange is underserved. So in the bead program, and I'll walk you through in a minute, but bead dollars, when, you, when the state gets the bead money, they first have to spend it on the gray. If they have money left over, they can spend it on the orange. If they have money left over from that, they can spend it on community anchor institutions. If they have money left over from that, they can spend it on digital equity. So, so now let's talk about why is it that we need government intervention here. And Gary hit on it a little bit, just about the cost of you know, fiber deployment in rural areas. Um, it becomes uneconomic. My rule of thumb was always use a factor, a, a multiplier of about two, two and a half percent against the capex per home pass. Um, that translates into the minimum ARPU you need to make it viable. So if you have $2,000 of investment, it's per location connected. So, and it's a 50% take rate. That's $4,000 of investment 
multiplied by two to two and a half percent, you're at 80 to 100 dollars of minimum ARPU in that area to make it viable. Just a quick rule of thumb. Um, and really, you know, that four thousand dollars is kind of the minimum break point of when people go, ah, I think I can make it, I, I don't think I can make it. It really comes down to take rate uh, when you're talking about that. Yeah. Barumba uh, Chikaloa, Chikalawa uh, from Lumen uh, Technologies asks, Jim may not comment on Texas controller Glenn Hager's stance that the current maps are flawed or that the process to lodge complaints is cumbersome. However, it is of interest to us to hear from him on how he's allaying the fears that the maps are accurate. Yeah, so um, let, let me jump into that. It's kind of a couple slides later, but as you think about Texas, and Texas is that, that bar represented, I think, 9 to 10 percent of the unserved locations in the country. As you work through the formula, $42 billion is to be spent. NTIA gets 2 percent for administrative cost. Um, each state and state entity, which includes the territories, get a $100 million minimum. And then from that balance, 90 percent is driven by unserved locations. So about 35 million will be driven by unserved locations. And if Texas has 10 percent, lo and behold, they get three and a half billion dollars for broadband deployment in the state of Texas. Pretty big dollars. Uh, if you go back to that map, you know, and you look at Nevada. Nevada, you know, it's a small bar. And as you think about it, you might go, well, is that fair? Um, is Texas really that unserved and are we really this served? And the issue is one, people complain about our fabric, that it is missing locations. And the first release in Alaska, we missed some villages. Um, Who would have thought that there is villages out in Alaska that you had to find? Um, but no, we found them. They're in version two, so we fixed it in version two. Um, so that people have complained about, they also complain that we identified boulders as broadband serviceable locations, and we did. You wouldn't believe how some boulders in a forest have a shape and color differential of pixels that looks like a house. So it's a house. So we identified those. But the, to me, those are minimal. We always said our, our fabric is accurate to about 99.5%. So and identifying which building is correct 98.5% of the time. So we may miss a percent, but that's a million locations we may miss. So it is a, you know, an issue. The bigger issue is did Comcast report correctly? Did Charter report correctly? Did AT&T report correctly? Oh, and did Timo report correctly? Because if those locations are reported as served, they're thrown out and they don't count towards funding. And what parties have argued is that this, the, the FCC is too dependent upon the ISPs providing accurate information to which they say they never have before. Why are they providing it now? That's the argument. I can't attest to it, but there is a challenge window available to all parties to challenge the accuracy of the coverage. So I showed you how a consumer could do it on the map. All parties could file with the FCC by January 13th, it was the official date, of coverage challenges. Those coverage challenges were, uh, were supplied by states, by localities, cities. They all undertook a massive data exercise to try and identify where they didn't believe Comcast told the truth. Um, just because Christian walked in, I thought, pick on Comcast. Um, and that's, what's, that's, that's one of the issues is the FCC hasn't clearly identified how they will adjudicate challenges in these bulk processes. How do I prove that Christian doesn't provide 100 megabit to my house. How do, you, how do you challenge that? If you've got ideas, the FCC's listening, 
because that's a hard thing to challenge something that doesn't exist because Christian said it's there and the other twist on it is it's there or it can be made available within 10 days um, so it's 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 a hard thing for consumers cities states municipalities to challenge they're all up in arms um, I've had I, Alaska I've talked to the senator in Alaska my map didn't make him happy so Senator Sullivan called me and wanted to know what we were going to do to fix the problem. We fixed it for him. So that's, I mean, this is, this is in all the way up to the top. The White House is very concerned about the quality of these maps. There are senators writing letters right and left to NTIA to, exclude, to, to extend the challenge time window to get this correct. NTIA has not yet moved. There was a letter yesterday from uh, Senators Klobuchar, Angus King, and one other one that said, we should just keep moving. We can't delay this. We gotta get this stuff moving. If we keep delaying, it just will not happen. Gotta keep it moving. You agree? Yeah, it was kind of a two-part question. But so um, I think you said what they do is take the $40 billion or $65 billion, and it's allocated based on percentage, right? Mm -hmm. So does it really matter that much, like Texas, even if, even my own thought is that probably 800,000 homes may be a little bit short, but if they're getting 10% of the funds, does it really matter at this point? Um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's what, what parties are arguing is that it, it's not that it's a constant undercount across states, that certain states were just really missed badly, and that's the states are arguing that. But I would agree, it, it's, you know, it probably gets washed out you know, if, if this is really the first cut, version two of this, which comes out in May, I don't think will change a lot, but it will shift a bit. But I don't think funding in Texas will go down to a billion. It's still going to be a big number, you know, maybe 8%, maybe not nine. And then the second question, I think a while back you had, I think, um, given an interview where you thought it was roughly 25, I want to say 25 million, I'm going off memory. Um, how does this line up with, with that? I was asked that question specifically by NTIA, who got this map and said, Jim, you said 20, 25 million. The map's saying 14 million if you add in a factor for homes. It was about 18. And the, the differential was my information was based upon data from two years ago. So FCC 477 from June 2021, I think it was. So coverage naturally has expanded since then. Um, the other thing that occurred, um, there's just a number of issues that drove it down. But it's just the continual improvement in coverage that we didn't have in that first number that I quoted. Okay, and then I've got one other question, but it'll be at, at the end. Okay, so. I'll come back to you. So, the, you know, this back to the economics. So why, why does this, why do the government have to get involved? Why? Um, and the reason why is there's communities that are just underserved. Um, you can see, you know, Texas has a lot. And the economics of Texas does not play well. We did this map a couple years ago. We looked at areas not served by cable, nor by fiber. To us, this is really the unserved. You can't really get to adequate broadband speeds with copper. I mean, you can try, but it's just a patchwork. It's, it's not going to be long term. Cable is sufficient, um, and fiber is sufficient. And when we looked at it, we then ran our cost models to say, okay, what's the fiber to the home cost per location passed in these parts of the country? The red is $100,000 per home passed. So let's do my math. Let's say they get 100% take rate. You have to have an ARPU, eh, I probably won't do my math right, 25, no, 2,000 a month in ARPU. No one's ever gonna go there. Why would they? There's just no economic payback. And as you look at this, you know, it's rural America. You don't have the density. And that's really what kills the deployment of cable and fiber. Cable systems aren't everywhere. Cable hits probably 85% of the homes in the country. They came into communities and they had outs in the community. Many, some of the uh, early agreements said, 
you know, we, we need you to serve any location that has a um, linear density over 30 to 35. Below that, people knew it didn't make economic sense. You can't do it. So, I mean, in part, that's why we have the cable systems we have today is because they approach this from an economic standpoint. They didn't get subsidies. They just deployed. And they deployed where it's economically efficient. And you have now this map. This is where it's not. And how do you get service out there? And that's really what the government intervention is about, is to try and make sure that all communities have access to broadband. It's really, you know, it's the, it's the utility of the 21st century. You need broadband to survive in the world today. You can't do anything without access to broadband. We, we did, um, this is a map, I, I put it in here, this is um, Maine, yeah, confused. State of Maine, I should add that as a quiz question to see if anybody knew what the state of Maine looked like, but um, these are the unserved areas, and actually the unserved locations. This is actually a point by point map. Purple is um, actually a cost greater than 125,000. Um, Ardoff is the gray. So there were Ardoff winners who won these areas, and in Ardoff, Many of, these area, many of the providers in RDOF said, we can provide gigabit service. I highly doubt it, but they said they could provide gigabit service and they were able to enter the auction without penalty and they won those certain portions of Maine. This is the cost profile of Maine. Um, all of them look, we, FCC has always referred to this as the cost hockey stick. It's, they all look like this. There's just, as you get out into the linear density when it starts to get below 15 per road mile, you get this uh, uh, inflection point that really skyrockets. You know, this highest cost point is $160,000 for that location. We've seen locations with million dollar fiber runs. You know, Alaska, it's a lot to, to run in Alaska. Um, what fixed wireless providers say, and what Steve says, is I can provide a cost-effective service that doesn't, you don't need to do this. And I would argue it's more in here, not here. These are more satellite, because even fixed wireless doesn't make sense out here. You got one person per 10 square miles it's these locations up here. You got the cabin. If you tried to run fixed wireless service to that, backhaul is going to be extremely expensive unless you could use SpaceX for the backhaul. If you have to put a tower or anything out there, you have nothing to unitize it over. It's that one customer absorbs all the cost. So fixed wireless makes sense like in this area here. <clears throat> What, I'll, I'll ruin the story because I'm not sure I'll get there. What BEAD does, BEAD focuses on fiber. Fiber gets the priority money. So any fiber project is prioritized up until a point of an extremely high cost threshold. Over that, other technologies can come into play, but if it's under that, it's got to be fiber. Fixed wireless can't bid. When we may have helped a federal agency as they put together some document that covered BEAD. When we looked at that, that number was in the fifteen to thirty thousand dollar range. So we've moved past the sweet spot for fixed wireless because now you've gotten into densities that are so low that it really makes sense just to run fiber, because if you're going to build to a single sol solitary customer two miles out or five miles out, just run a fiber run. You're not going to gain anything with fixed wireless service. And if the FCC excludes satellite or NTIA, what do you do with this tail? So that, that's, that's the question states have to wrestle with. 
Um, we did this, I think, early on. What states needed to run FTTP? When we ran this initially, Texas, I think, was almost $7 billion to hit the unserved. This was on an earlier estimate. It's not based upon the, the latest BDC, so that number will come down. But there is a massive requirement of funding needed. So let's get into the government intervention. I'll fly through some of these just because uh, we're limited on time. But I'm going to start historically. So we had the Connect America Fund. So the Connect America Fund was set up in 2015. It provided funding out to the price cap carriers, so AT&T, Lumens, um, Verizon, Windstream. There's about 15 carriers who are price cap companies. They got $1.6 billion annually for six years, so a total of almost $10 billion. The build requirement, anybody know what the build, what broadband speed they had to provide under this? Anybody know? 10.3, or no, 10.1, actually, 10.1. So the U.S. government spent $10 billion to guarantee that you could get 10-1 service in 2015. The program ended in 2020. These areas that potentially got that funding are likely the areas that today are unserved and will be eligible for BEAT. Oh, I had 10-1 up there. So if anybody was actually looking at my material. so. Um, we then get into, let me jump down to this model here. This was the alternative Connect America Fund. Um, we did not name this, we actually developed the model, but um, this was for uh, rate of return carriers. This again was about $1.6 billion, but it was over a 10 year period. This is still in place. Again, it targets 10-1, but they've upped it. They've encouraged providers to expand beyond that. Notice the agencies involved, FCC, FCC, FCC. All these were primarily FCC. Um, Connect America Fund 2, this was their first big auction. It was 1.48 billion, it was 148 million over 10 years. Most of the, and this occurred in 2019, 2020, it was at the end of the Connect America Fund, they auctioned off portions of what the carriers who didn't take the money here, the, they were auctioned off here. Um, the priority was gigabit service. Uh, they had to be technology agnostic, so they just said gigabit. Um, and this is where fixed wireless providers came in uh, and actually were able to bid and won. And actually, most of the participants in this were non, um, the big winners were not current carriers. There were uh, electric co-ops, wireless ISPs, um, some satellite firms, one. Then we get into RDOF. Um, RDOF was their second big auction. John was one of the big winners here. He won a billion dollars. Um, they're now trying to figure out how they're going to actually build that out. Um, it's a big part of Texas that they won. Um, that was 9.2 billion. Then there's another RDOF that may come after BEAD. We're still not sure how this works. That's got 11 billion that the FCC already has allocated for it. And then I talked about the mobility fund too. This is targeted, uh, targeting those areas unserved by 5G. So you can see there's lot, lots of money here. Then we had the CARES Act in 2021. The Big thing here, two things I'll highlight was one, it set up the EBB program, which was they gave a $50, month, $50 a month subsidy to those parties who wanted to buy broadband service if they qualified, so they'd be at a certain poverty level. That money ran out really quick. This is the rip and replace that Ian talked about. So it's the Huawei and ZTE gear that were in the network. It was considered a national security risk. Um, carriers had to uh, rip it out. They allocated $1.9 billion. They received requests for $5.6 billion, so they'll build a shortfall. This is not just wireless. It's also Lumen Hotwire Windstream. The one big benefit of this for cost people is there is a Widelity report published by the FCC for this program that specifies this is how the FCC will reimburse for the replacement of that gear. 
So it's got actually landline gear or fiber gear, but also wireless gear. We jump to the American Rescue Plan. The big one here is that there is 10 billion made uh, available for infrastructure. It focused on fiber deployment, but not always. 3.7 billion was allocated. And then they, uh, the rest of it, we'll skip. And then we get the bead. So bead is the IIJA, the, I forget what it stands for now, but it's got $65 billion identified for broadband. I said before 42.5. That's because 42.45 was allocated to states for broadband deployment. So each state gets 100 million, 90% is based on unserved, 10% is based on high cost. You have to build out a minimum of 120. Fiber is prioritized. You have to offer a low cost plan for, um, um, in poverty for people that qualify under poverty. Uh, and there's, uh, I think, an encouragement for a middle class plan. So they're trying to make it so that if you take this money, at least you offer affordable rates. One of the problems with RDOF was some of the carriers were going to charge $200 a month for service. So they got subsidized, and now you're going to have to pay $200. It just seemed like a slap in the face to some people. Uh, ACP is 14.2. This replaced the EBB. This dropped the uh, funding down to $30 a month. What coincided with, with this was AT&T, Comcast, Charter, Lumen, all now offer ACP rate plans, where they were. That rate plan is $30 a month for 120 service. Lo and behold, people get it for free. So there's other stuff. There's middle mile, distance learning, digital equity. Um, so back to the map. So this is why this map is important, why the fabric is important that rolls into the FCC coverage, why that coverage is important, because it drives speed. Texas gets 9.4% of the total, which is about 3.4 billion, I think it is. Something. It's a big number. On top of what they got from ARP, on top of what they got from CARES. So the allocation will be based upon the second version of the broadband data collection effort, which is uh, coming out in May. The challenges, as I said, were due January 13th. Um, the difference between this and the FCC programs, FCC had a national program. We had one set of rules, one auction program. Um, this, the congressional leaders didn't like the results of RDOF. So they said, let's push this out to the states. So now, there will be 56 different state programs. They're, they have guidelines, but there's no guarantee that they're going to be the same. So if you're a national carrier, AT&T operates in 21 states, maybe more with their recent announcement, they're going to have to understand 22 different sets of rules as they go into this effort. Huge, huge. And these rules are being put together by eligible entities, which are the states and territories, who have just recently set up their broadband office. Texas didn't have a broadband office until late last year. So you've got relatively new people coming in to manage the disbursement of these funds. Fiber is the preferred technology. I talked about that. There, there will be fights, and, and each state will set its threshold. So we have been contacted by various wireless organizations of what information can we provide to the states to help them effectively pull that thing down so that fixed wireless is a viable service. Because you have limited money. And if the state really wants to get broadband out, they need to make sure they spend it in an appropriate manner, and that's Part of this is one of the triggers. <clears throat> so if you think about this, this is before bead. States had announced this was as of uh, July last year. I hadn't updated, but $35 billion was already announced by states in broadband programs. We're adding to that another $45 billion. 
You add to that the carrier match, which is a minimum of 25%, likely more 30, 40%. So the total broadband spend over the next four years, likely $100 billion on the fiber deployment. So big dollars. Um, yeah, this is California. California. Mm. Yeah, let me skip California. You can look at this in the deck. But California has a $7 billion fund pre bead. Um, they, uh, they have built or are building their own state owned middle mile network. They're trying to expand that middle mile network out closer to the end locations to minimize last mile cost. They've put together economic zones for the program bidding, so carriers can come in and bid on various parts of the state. So you can look through that. So bringing this all back together, we've heard that there's supply chain and inflationary pressures. I mean, we're looking at costs this year that are up 10, 20, 30% over last year. So we know costs are up. Um, we know uh, we, we've had discussions with some of the fiber uh, firms that construct or make the fiber. They actually didn't have capacity as of, I think, a year, year and a half ago. They were stretched on capacity. They've now built multiple more factories. They have guaranteed to the White House that there will be ample fiber available for these programs. There is a Buy America portion of this program that they're going to have to work around because, you know, as Jeff said, the, the ONTs, you can't make those chips in country. Um, they're not, there's no manufacturing for those types of chips in the US. Um, so will this government intervention trigger additional issues? So you've got $100 billion spend coming over the next four years. I, it's a big spending increase. So there may be additional pressures on the supply chain um, the consumer should benefit because 100 megabit becomes the new minimum and gigabit becomes the new norm. We've got ACP pricing coming out so the lower income people can get assistance. There are new edge out and edge in introduces new competition. Edge out is what um, Comcast or Charter is doing in Texas with the bead dollars. They're edging out of their footprint. Then there are the electric co-ops who may take the money and then edge in to areas that weren't part of the bid. If I'm going to build a network somewhere, I'm not going to constrain it to this set of customers. I'm going to look at the entire area to say, I need to run into the town. And as I run into town for the backhaul, I might as well expand some of the network there. So that, that money will introduce new edge in. Um, digital equity. Digital equity is a big part of the program. This will increase education of consumers and availability of devices so that more people take up service. So uh, fixed carriers are facing new pressures. So we know the mobile providers are entering the fixed market. We heard that today. Leo is providing high speed service. Um, I talked about the edge in, edge out. But the fixed broadband carriers should benefit from all this because one, we know broadband is a vital part of the economy. So as we expand broadband, there should be an economic somewhat uptick or uplift from that. There's greater per revenue potential because of digital equity, higher take rates. Um, they'll have the ability to take high cost areas and get them subsidized or alternatively for some carriers just walk away. As that area is bid out, you know, why does Geary want to continue to provide copper service in an area that's already won in RDOF or in bead? We just abandon, we walk away. Why, why continue maintaining it? There's other considerations, cord cutting, pricing pressure, um, coax end of life. Some of the coax plant has been in place for 20, 30, 35 years effective life of coax 10 15 20 years on average so these are the endpoints of some of that plant what do the cable carriers do we know they're going to try and edge out their fiber but some of their plant is just becoming old and they're going to have to replace some of that plant at some point 
Um, consolidation. So we've got, actually I think there's 3,500 ISPs in the country. There's going to be consolidation. Uh, the WISP. I forget how many WISP carriers there are. It's like the cable industry back before Comcast became Comcast. There was a bunch of mom and pop cable companies that got aggregated over time. Same thing's going to happen here. You got all these mom and pop fiber companies being funded by the government, all these WISP sitting out there. There will be consolidation to drive out cost. And with that, I'm done. So sorry. Sorry, it took so long. <laughs> Questions? We don't have any online questions. Any questions for the house? Steve? The, the last comment, the 3,700, you know, independent, the mom and pops, yeah. what percentage of the market do they make up? Do you know? I don't think it's a big portion. I think it's a big portion in rural America it is where it's at. So it's really um, probably maybe 10, 20% of the market. I don't, it's a rough guess, but it's not big. More questions? Someone wants to get out. <laughs> Next action plan on the bead program you mentioned, right? So the, the complaint period is over. There's a stack. Do you know how big a, the stack of complaints are? Have it, you seen the tentative list? It, I have not. Well, the challenges I have not seen. We, we actually helped on the fabric. There's two challenges, fabric locations and then coverage. Fabric challenges uh, were in the millions. Um, and we're getting millions more coming in. And then on the coverage, uh, they got a lot. I'll just say that. I, we, we are not involved in the coverage challenges. Um, as far as complaints, um, there are certain parties encouraging states to sue the NTA now to preclude them dispersing the money. So it's, it's going to be a political battle for the next five, six months, if not longer. How do you see that playing out? Do you think you, the feds are just going to spend the money? Or are they going to hold back 10% of it just as a cautionary till the, the residuals ironed out? Um, I think according to the NOFO, they don't have that. I don't know that they have that capability. Um, so I think they have to disperse it all. Yeah, okay. You talked about the map being available for download. What about the underlying data? Is that something that uh, is available for third party analysis? or? Are we limited to the map? Um, it's a, uh, it's, uh, by the way, I'm asking this as an academic that does a lot of third party analysis. Oh, yeah, I know. Um, you can download the entire data collection. So there are, we've done it. it. There's 800 million records in the data set. You can download it all. It's got, I think it may have the census block identifier and the H3 identifier on it. Um, it does not have the latitude and longitude. If you want to do research, um, the FCC and us are trying to come up with a research license document that parties can use it for research and download the full data set. So, working on that. Excellent. Yeah, there, there is a tier for you. So, if you're a nonprofit, you can sign a license agreement today. You go into the BDC platform. Um, it's a, what they call a tier four license, and you can get that today, and you can actually get all the fabric data. It's just uh, under certain license conditions that you can't use it for commercial purposes. The, the issue with it, it doesn't allow research purposes. So that's what we're trying to work on. Great. Thanks.